<laughs> okay. So good, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are happy to welcome you to our talk. Uh, and it is a great pleasure to introduce the person who is the best qualified person to talk about the language uh, portfolio. It's uh, I'm happy to introduce Professor uh, Emeritus of Trinity College, David Little. Welcome, David. Uh, and we are happy that you're going to introduce us to all the history and uh, the challenges of the European language portfolio. So David Little's uh, profound expertise in applied linguistics, uh, particularly in the realms of autonomy in language learning, the common European framework of languages and the language portfolio make you, David, a uniquely qualified person to shed light on this still ongoing challenging issue. And uh, you have made throughout your career um, as a professor, as a teacher, as a researcher, substantial contribution to the concept of autonomous language learning. And uh, also in, within uh, this uh, uh, part uh, in the field of the contribution of the portfolio, language portfolio and the CFR in, to, this, um, to this realm of, of language learning. So... Um, Today's webinar is centered around the European language portfolio, which sometimes seems to have lost uh, reputation or is not that present anymore. That's what brought us, uh, the, um, the executive committee of uh, Circles, um, to the, the idea to invite you, David, to kind of bring, bring this, this very important um, tool and this very important concept to our attention again. So please join uh, join me in attending a warm welcome to you, David Little, uh, and uh, I'm handing over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Happy to have you here. Thank you. You should be able to yes. my screen. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, a small but select group. And in the next 50 minutes or so, I want to talk about the European language portfolio, starting with its origins, then sketching its history, considering why it failed, where it failed, why it succeeded when it succeeded, and ending up with a few reflections on its possible future. The European language portfolio has three parts, a language passport, a language biography, and a dossier. The language passport is a summary of the owner's experience of learning and using languages other than the mother tongue. It's a document that can be used separately from the rest of the portfolio for purposes of informing other people about one's experience. And of course, it has to be regularly updated. The language biography is a structured learning journal, a, a sort of dynamic accompaniment to language learning. And the dossier is usually a free form folder in which the owner collects work in progress and evidence to support the claims that he or she makes about achieved proficiency in the different languages he or she knows. The ELP has three focuses. It's intended to support the development of learner autonomy, to promote intercultural awareness, the development of intercultural competence, and to promote plurilingualism, the Council of Europe's concept of linguistic repertoires in which two or more languages are integrated in a single communicative capacity. And Again, according to the Council of Europe, it has two interdependent functions, a pedagogical function, in other words, to support 
learning and teaching, and a reporting function, a sort of practical demonstration of the owner's progress and proficiency in language learning. The ELP is linked to the Common European Framework of Reference for Languages by checklists of ICANN descriptors, which are arranged by CFR activities and levels, and they're used for goal setting and self-assessment. And in most versions of the portfolio, they constitute part of the language biography. In the talk, as I've already said, I want to begin by saying more about the relation between the ELP and the CFR, because it's much more intimate than simply that link between the levels in the CFR and the checklist descriptors in the ELP. I'll then sketch the history of the ELP from the pilot projects at the end of the 1990s to the end of validation in 2010. Then I'll offer you a rather sketchy answer to the question, why was the ELP a relative failure? And an equally brief answer to the question, why did the ELP succeed with learners from migrant backgrounds? And I'll conclude by considering under what circumstances, in my view, the ELP might make a comeback. First of all, then, the relation between the ELP and the CFR. It's important to begin by saying a little about the CFR and language teaching and learning. And in doing that, the first thing to do is to dispose of a red herring. In chapter six of the CFR, we read, it's not the function of the framework to promote one particular language teaching methodology, but instead to present options. What that statement intends to imply is that the CFR is a neutral document as regards the educational practices of Council of Europe member states. But far too many people have taken it to mean that the CFR itself doesn't have any pedagogical or methodological implications. But the fact is that by defining language proficiency as a variety of language use, the CFR implies that target language use should play a central role in language teaching and learning. And that is a fairly fundamental pedagogical or methodological implication. What's more, the CFR's descriptive apparatus portrays the language user learner as an autonomous social agent. That's the force of the can-do element in all the descriptors that are used to define proficiency. What someone can do is a measure of their autonomy. And the CFR itself commends learner autonomy or learning how to learn in that same chapter six, from which I quote in the first bullet point on the screen. The Council of Europe has always been committed to learner centeredness. It's worth noting that the European Convention on Human Rights is concerned with the individual citizen as an autonomous social agent. The first modern languages projects carried out by the Council of Europe were managed under the aegis of the 
Committee for Out-of-School Education. In other words, the committee that concerned itself, and we're going back now to the 1970s, with adult education. And the defining concept of that work was self-learning. And by self-learning, the Committee for Out-of-School Education, I think, understood two things. Autonomous learning, self-managed learning, but also learning that was rooted in the individual learner's experience and existing knowledge. This explains the interest that the early work in modern languages, foreign languages, had in autonomous learning. Henri Olek's uh, pioneering report to the Council of Europe of 1979, Autonomy and Foreign Language Learning, and also self-assessment, Mats Oskarsson's parallel report uh, also to the Council of Europe of 1978. This commitment to learner-centeredness, this concept of self-learning understood in the way I've explained, also explains why in those days there was great hostility in Council of Europe working groups to formal tests and exams. This is something that John Trim, for many years, the chief advisor to the Council of Europe's Modern Languages work elaborated on in an interview that I conducted with him, with Lyd King, in 2013. This was published in 2014. The goal was to achieve the democratization of language learning. So a great deal of pioneering work was done in the 1970s on analyzing learners' needs not only via Olek's 1979 report, but more generally, there was great emphasis on involving learners themselves in all aspects of learning and teaching. The ideal was that decisions concerning learning, how it should be organized, and so on and so forth, should be taken as close as possible to the point of teaching and learning. In 1991, the federal Swiss authorities hosted for the Council of Europe an intergovernmental symposium at Rüschlikon. And the purpose of that symposium was to take stock of the work that had been done in modern languages up to that point and to indicate directions for future work. The symposium concluded by making two key recommendations to the Council of Europe. First, that it should establish a comprehensive, coherent and transparent framework for the description of language proficiency, which will enable learners to find their place and assess their progress with reference to a set of defined reference points. So that's a preliminary description of the CEFR, the framework. Comprehensive, coherent, and transparent. The CFR, as published in 2001, claims to be that. The defined reference points, of course, became the six proficiency levels, A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. But between framework and reference points uh, and the description of language proficiency, note that the goal is to enable learners to find their place and assess their progress. So the framework itself in its original conception was a tool to assist learners, not to provide an international metric for exam boards or any of the other things that the CFR is believed to do. It was a guide or aid for learners. And then the second recommendation 
was that the Council of Europe should set up a working party to consider possible forms and functions of a European language portfolio to be issued under its aegis and held by individuals in which they may record their cumulative experience and qualifications in modern languages. The original idea that the Council of Europe itself would issue the European language portfolio didn't, of course, come to pass. But the idea that the portfolio is the property of the individual learner remained fundamental. The report on the symposium indicates that the need for a framework was most urgently felt in respect of assessment and certification. Despite what the first of those recommend recommendations says, which implies that the CFR is a tool to help learners, the need felt by language testing agencies and other educational authorities was for some kind of general set of proficiency levels to which they could link their examinations in order to facilitate comparison between exams across languages, between countries, and so on and so forth. Much of the discussion of a possible ELP focused on its reporting function, ways in which it could be used as a supplement to formal tests and other modes of assessment. But in the report, there's one substantial and radical contribution that focused on learner autonomy, and that came from uh, Professor Viljo Koenen of the University of Tampere in Finland. From the beginning, the ELP was conceived with adult learners in mind, and within the perspective of lifelong learning, or as the Council of Europe called it in those days, permanent education. What happened after the Rüschlikon Symposium was this. First of all, work proceeded on developing the CFR. Various support studies were commissioned and published. I myself uh, contributed um, a study uh, on strategic competence. And two drafts of the CFR were published in quick succession in 1996. As regards the ELP, a working group, the names of the members are the same as those of the contributors to the document you can see on the screen, worked towards a set of proposals for developing an ELP, but it was only a set of proposals. And the second draft of the framework and this document of proposals were presented at an intergovernmental conference held in Strasbourg in 1997. That conference adopted the CFR for revision and publication, a process that carried through to the final publication of the canonical version of the CFR in English and French in 2001. As for the ELP, the conference noted the following, the project group aware of the need to encourage and recognize a wider range of cultural and language learning achievements than a record of formal qualifications alone can provide, requests the CDCC to develop further a European language portfolio and to promote its introduction. So the idea was to go from these proposals for development to actual portfolios. CDCC is the Committee for Cultural Cooperation, which was a sort of subcommittee of the Council of Europe, uh, abolished at the end of the 1990s, but up until then in charge of work in culture and education. So in 1997, 
the ELP was still a concept that hadn't been converted into a practical tool uh, or used in different domains of language learning. Now to a rapid history of the ELP from the pilot projects, which followed quickly on that conference in 1997 to the end of validation in 2010. The pilot projects involve 15 Council of Europe member states, private language schools under the aegis of equals, the European Association for, Association for Quality Language Services, and universities under the auspices of CERCLA and the European Language Council. Um, I, at the time, was not only involved in the Council of Europe's language education work, but between 1995 and 2000 was president of CERCLA, so it was obvious enough that CERCLA should become involved in, in this. The number of learners and teachers involved in these different pilot projects varied enormously. Um, in one or two cases, it was just a couple of classrooms. There was, on the other hand, in Russia, uh, an enormously ambitious and large-scale project. The pedagogical focus of these early projects was mostly on learn autonomy rather than intercultural awareness, intercultural competence, and plurilingualism. As you might expect, English was by far the most commonly learnt language uh, among the different projects. Rolf Scherer was rapporteur général for the pilot projects, and he toured around to various countries and talked to learners involved in the projects. And one of the things he particularly questioned them about was the key role that self-assessment played in ELP use. And he found that overwhelmingly learners of all ages and stages were in favor of self-assessment. But then they tended to smile cynically and say, but who would pay any attention to their views? During the pilot projects, we had the elaboration of ELP principles and guidelines, a four-page document that explained what the ELP was based on, how it should be configured, and how it should be used. And also in the pilot projects, two guides were developed and published, one for ELP developers that was written by Peter Lenz and Günther Schneider of the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, and the other for teachers and teacher trainers, and that was written by myself and Radka Perzlova of Charles University, Prague. In 2000, the Council of Europe set up a validation committee. I've already mentioned that it quickly dismissed the idea of itself issuing an ELP, and in any case, as soon as one began to think about the different ages of learners who might be involved in ELP use, it became clear that you would need a variety of different models to meet the needs of those different learners. So the principles and guidelines were issued, and it was up to member states to assign to one or another agency the task of designing an ELP, which was then submitted to the validation committee in Strasbourg. The first ELPs to be validated came, unsurprisingly, from the pilot projects. I myself was, at this stage, a consultant to the validation committee, and I felt slightly awkward that the people who'd, invo who'd been involved in the pilot projects were also, for the most part, involved in the validation committee. So when it came to validating their 
ELPs, they were sort of marking their own homework. Though in fairness, uh, one never got to be involved in the validation process for one's own portfolio. It quickly emerged that the principles and guidelines were not an appropriate tool for validating or developing ELPs because they were too brief and they were couched in far too general terms. And so I took the initiative upon myself to begin to create an annotated version of the principles and guidelines, which was a matter really of assembling case law and explaining principles and guidelines in the light of validation practice. Uh, the date of two, uh, 2011 here is misleading uh, because it was the date that the Council of Europe attached to the version of the principles and guidelines originally conceived and written in 2003, but done again in 2011 for the website. Towards the end of the validation committee, my late friend Francis Goulier, an inspector general uh, from uh, France, who was very much involved in the work of the ELP Validation Committee for the whole of its life, uh, he drew up a report which was based on a close study of all the massive documentation we'd gathered around the validation process in order to identify the most persistent problem areas in getting a, an ELP validated. And those problem areas are the ones you see on the screen. Most models were not wonderfully clearly presented, and there was often quite a lot of consistency. Arrangements for self-assessment were not always clear, self-evident, easy to implement. A bit surprisingly, many developers more or less ignored the fact that the ELP was an invention of the Council of Europe and was, and was intended, among many other things, to promote uh, European cooperation in language education. Uh, and then the principle of learner ownership. Uh, one of the ways in which the Validation Committee insisted on this was that it was not prepared to allow a portfolio where it was clearly intended that teachers would correct their learners' self-assessment. What you see on the screen now is an overview on the left of the number of ELPs validated year by year, and on the right, the number of ELPs developed for different domains. On the left, you can see 2000 was the year when the Validation Committee began its work, and those first six portfolios were all ones arising from the pilot projects. Um, but then in the first four years, we have this rush of portfolios for validation, a lull in 2005, another bulge in 2006, then an apparent decline, 2007, 8, and 9, and another bulge in 2010, because the Council of Europe had made it known to member states that it was bringing validation to an end. So those 15 were last gasp validations. I explained earlier on in the talk that the ELP was originally conceived with adult language learning and permanent education, lifelong learning in mind. But once we launched the ELP on the world of education, it was in the school sector that it was mostly uh, taken up. You can see primary, secondary, upper secondary and higher education. So the universities come in there. It's also uh, worth saying that there were a number of portfolios in that first category, adolescents and adults, where use by adolescents was predominant. And that meant that it was they, those were portfolios also used in upper secondary education. 
At the bottom of the screen, I've noted the fact that the Circle version of the European language portfolio, which we developed in my centre in Trinity College in Dublin, was validated in 2002. So it was the 29th ELP out of a final 133, I think, or 118, to be to be validated. Um, and we developed a, a bilingual document with English on one side and French on the other, because those are the two official languages of the Council of Europe. And members of CERCLA were then um, able to replace either the English or the French by text in their uh, national language. So um, versions in 2002 were in Czech, Slovak, Italian, Spanish, and German. As I've just said, the majority of validated ELPs were developed for language learners at school, but the ELP failed to gain significant traction in national education systems. And it rather quickly came to be forgotten. So why was that? Well, to begin with, I think most educational systems weren't ready. Ministers of education tended to welcome the ELP, not because they understood the rather complex implications it had for teaching and learning, but because they thought it would be a sort of magic bullet. Foreign languages were problematic in many educational systems, and more than one ministry official said to me over the years, well, if the teachers can't do it, maybe if we give the kids a portfolio, they'll, they'll be able to do it for themselves. And, and this attitude perhaps helps to explain that when funding was provided for ELP development, it didn't always include the cost of preparing teachers to use the ELP, and it rarely lasted beyond the pilot phase. This is something that's discussed in detail in the impact study carried out by Maria Stoicheva, uh, Heike Speitz, and Gareth Hughes for the validation committee. Learner autonomy, which is central to the concept of the ELP and the promotion of learner autonomy fundamental to its use, Learner autonomy, which expresses itself through goal setting and self-assessment based on those checklists that I've mentioned, this is largely alien to European education systems. Curricula talk a lot about autonomous learning, critical thinking, that sort of thing, but pedagogies do very little to implement or support learner autonomy. What's more, most language education continues to focus on individual languages in isolation. Certainly in the years when the ELP was still a novelty, intercultural awareness and intercultural competence were not much in view in national education systems, and plurilingualism was not a widespread educational goal. In 2008-2011, uh, I led a, an ECML project to promote whole school use of the ELP, use of the ELP to bring together all language learning in a particular school. Uh, the idea being that, you know, you'd have teachers of English and French and Spanish and German and whatnot. Um, but it was almost impossible to find any school in any member state where the ELP was being used for this purpose. I think in the end, we were able to identify two. Uh, that's not to say there weren't more, but we were only able to identify two. One, a very small private girls boarding school in the extreme west of Austria, and another, um, a secondary school in central Russia. There were also problems of integration. Oh dear, sorry about that. 
problems of integration, most ELPs were not developed as part of a larger project of educational reform. So the descriptive apparatus and the proficiency levels were difficult to relate to the curriculum and official exams. Often there was practically no common ground between them. Also, most language classrooms work with a textbook. By, by introducing the ELP, schools set up a conflict with the textbook. Alternatively, they gave teachers a large amount of extra work. What's more, the CFR-ELP combination implies an assessment culture in which learners are active agents via self-assessment and the reflective learning on which it depends. And in most education systems, this is a wholly alien concept. And then there were problems with the model. The role of language use in language learning, which, as I've said, is fundamental to the CFR, implies that the checklists in the portfolio should be in the language or languages that learners are learning. But arguably, this works against the plurilingual idea that conceives of one's language repertoire as an integrated communicative capacity. On the other hand, if we say, OK, we respond to that by offering checklists in the learner's L1 or the language of schooling, so that self-assessment in all languages can be brought together, this works against the central role of language use in language learning. This problem is, I think, soluble, but it was too little recognized at the time. Too many ELPs were far too heavy. Heavy in the sense that they weren't very portable. Some of the portfolios developed for young learners, primary school learners, were, 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 were far too unwieldy for them to be able to put in a school bag and carry backwards and forwards between home and school. And they were too heavy also in the sense that they seemed to pose a direct challenge to the textbook. What's more, the validation committee was obliged, I think, to observe strict doctrinal orthodoxy. There was the assumption that all models would be fully implemented. Now, as defined in the principles and guidelines, the ELP provides a comprehensive embodiment of the Council of Europe's political, cultural, and educational ethos. But is it likely that any context of learning will respond equally to every dimension of that ethos? I don't think so. And yet, with one particular group of learners, at least in Ireland, the ELP was a great success. These were the models that were developed for migrant language learners. In Ireland, we had an ELP for use in primary education to support migrant pupils learning of English as language of schooling. We had a similar model in post-primary education that's to say lower and upper secondary. And then we had three models for adult immigrants. One for those who were newly arrived and had little or no English. Another for adult migrants who perhaps as asylum seekers had been living in the country for some time and had picked up quite a lot of English, at least informally. And thirdly, we had a model for adult immigrants who were preparing for mainstream vocational training and employment and often had significant educational qualifications uh, acquired in their country of origin. But all of those models were quite light in the sense that they were easily carried. Uh, and um, that, I think, was one factor in their success. 
Then there was the Milestone Project, the organization that developed these Irish models, Integrate Ireland Language and Training, got involved in an EU-funded project involving other institutions dealing with migrant language learning in Germany, Finland, Netherlands, and Sweden. And the colleagues from those other countries were very interested in the idea of the ELP and the models that we already had. And so one of the things that the Milestone Project did was to develop an ELP. And that was validated, as you can see, in 2002. And it was used with some success, not only in Ireland, but in those other countries. And then finally, there was a model for adult migrants uh, validated right at the end, uh, that model coming from Norway. Why did it succeed? Well, for all migrant learners, plurilingualism is a part of everyday reality. They understand what the Council of Europe means by an integrated plurilingual repertoire. What's more, intercultural awareness and intercultural competence are things that migrants urgently need in their new country of residence. The lack of textbooks for teaching English to migrants in Ireland meant that the ELP could be adopted as the foundation of all learning. So it wasn't in, com in competition with a textbook. It was a substitute for a textbook. And for migrants, the ELP had a genuine reporting function. Adult learners could show prospective employers practical evidence of what they were capable of. And not only in the language of the host community, because our portfolios allowed them also to report on what they could do in other languages they knew. And the primary and post-primary ELPs were used to inform class teachers, principals, school inspectors, and parents of learners' progress. For adult migrants, the ELP provided a basis for learning whatever their level of proficiency at the beginning and end. In Ireland, the development of a strong portfolio learning culture came to meet the portfolio assessment used by FETAC, the Adult Education Authority in Ireland. So we related FETAC learning outcomes to ELP checklists and our migrant learners achieved certification within the Irish system of adult education on the basis of work presented in their European language portfolios. And that meant that the ELP served as an instrument of educational integration. For migrant children and adolescents, again in Ireland, the ELP checklists were derived from the English language proficiency benchmarks, which we devised, which were adaptations of the first three levels of the CFR for primary and post-primary learners. These benchmarks weren't a curriculum in the usual sense, but a description of the extent to which immigrant learners could participate in the activities of the mainstream classroom at the successive proficiency levels. And the benchmarks and the ELP were supported by an ongoing program of in-service seminars for English language teachers. One of my PhD students undertook an ambitious study of the development of immigrant learners in primary schools in Ireland, uh, focusing on the benchmarks and the ELP. And uh, she and I subsequently abbreviated and rewrote her PhD thesis uh, for publication in the Cambridge English Profile series. Integrate Ireland Language and Training, which was responsible for all this work, was closed down in 2008. It was an early victim of the financial calamity that struck us. 
And as a consequence, use of the ELP in adult education and schools quickly diminished to vanishing point. And there are very few people in language education in Ireland now who remember those days and the work that was done. So could the ELP make a comeback? In answering that question, the first thing we have to do is to go back to basics. Taken together, the CFR and the ELP embody an approach to language education that has its roots in the European Convention on Human Rights and the work that I've referred to briefly in adult education back in the 1970s. A focus, therefore, on democratization of education on the basis of needs analysis and learner empowerment, and a conviction that curriculum, teaching, learning, and assessment should be indivisible, mutually supporting. The challenge posed by the CFR and the ELP still has to be met in most national education systems. But before it can be met, it must be much better understood than hitherto. The Council of Europe itself has attempted to encourage this process. Uh, in February last year, the Committee of Ministers issued a recommendation on the importance of plurilingual and intercultural education for democratic culture. And that is intended to renew interest in these matters. Is it time for a new start? For a fresh exploration of the implications of the CFR for learning and teaching as well as assessment, but also then I think a more flexible approach to ELP design and implementation. Everything I've said based on that previous slide implies that the CFR is a tool for constructive alignment. It challenges us to develop a pedagogical culture in which learning and assessment are inseparable, two sides of the same coin. This challenge derives from the fact that each of the CFR's can-do descriptors can be used simultaneously to specify a learning outcome provide a learning focus, and imply an assessment task. And of course, learners themselves can participate fully in this new culture, because from early childhood, we know what we can and cannot do. And can do is the way in which proficiency is defined in the CEFR. The European Language Portfolio mediates the CFR's ethos to learners, and enables them to manage their own learning on the basis of reflection driven by self-assessment. It may not be, um, you, you, you may not know that last year, Aligning Language Education with the CFR Handbook was published by the four institutions named on the slide, EAL to the European Association for Language Testing and Assessment, UK Association for Language Teaching and Assessment, British Council, and the Association for Language Testing in Europe. Um, this is quite an easy read, especially in the early sections. And if you're interested in the challenge of using the CFR as a tool of constructive alignment, it's not a bad place to begin. You can get it from the website of any of those four organizations as a free download. What about the university sector? Well, I've published four articles in language learning in higher education explaining from various perspectives how universities and especially language centers could make use of the CFR ELP combination. Some of the challenges to be confronted in any attempt to revive the ELP, it will be necessary to decide whether this new ELP is analog, in other words, pencil and paper, or digital or a combination of the two. The answer to that might vary by sector or institution. 
is it necessary to retain the canonical three-part structure or should a more flexible approach be adopted depending on local circumstances? What about plurilingualism? How do we reconcile the fact that many students will already know several languages when they come to university with the reality that university, most of them will learn just one language and in most universities in Europe, that one language will be English. We would need to tailor checklists of ICANN descriptors to the wide range of learning needs from institution-wide language programs at one extreme to languages for academic purposes at the other. Finally, a role for CERCLA in all of this? Well, CERCLA could certainly lead a revival of the ELP in the European university sector by setting up a working group to undertake the following tasks. Design a version of the ELP language passport that could be used by everyone. Draw up guidelines for the development of analog and digital versions of the ELP for use with different categories of students. Develop checklists of ICANN descriptors for use with different categories of student. This would provide a focus for research of various kinds that could be reported at CERCLA conferences. It could also lead to a project in the ECML's medium-term program beginning in 2028. But none of this is likely to prosper unless there's at least one university language somewhere in Europe, prepared to commit itself fully to aligning its language programs, curricula, teaching, learning, assessment to the CFR. And that, you'll be glad to know, colleagues, is the end. I've got three more slides, and I'm going to display each of them for a few seconds in case you want to capture them. First of all, three websites. The first of these websites is the Council of Europe's ELP website, which leads in two directions, developing and registering an ELP and using the ELP. That second section, using the ELP, brings you to the third website, the ECML's wide range of ELP-related resources. And the second of the URLs takes you to what is a sort of update of the milestone project in the Council of Europe's project to support adult migrant language learning. Uh, you have uh, that updated portfolio available. And then there are two pages of references in case you happen to want to track any of them down. There's the first. And there is the second. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Oh. Uh, let's be now start. Yes, thanks a lot, David. This was a very informative uh, and rich and thought provocative talk. And uh, it has accompanied us uh, through the history of the portfolio and the challenges. And I don't know how many of us are also feel also being challenged in their roles as teachers, educators, researchers, or as myself, language center directors. Um, and I would like to open the floor for questions and remarks, perhaps especially uh, related to the last part. How how could we see the future or how could we contribute to a future or revival of the uh, portfolio within our higher education sector or also within circles? So thank you for challenging us or making some suggestions, David. Uh, regarding our uh, contribu or possible contribution to further development. So my invitation goes to all colleagues who would like to come back to a remark or even uh, add a follow-up question or start a discussion. I think Sawa has a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Letter, for a very interesting and illuminating presentation. Uh, I had a long 
I had an interest into the ELP for a while. I worked many years ago in a primary school and I tried to use it. And for many years now I've been teaching in the university and it's always in my mind how to, how to integrate it. Uh, however, one of the questions you talked yourself about many versions of the ELP, which for me was a bit confusing when I was trying to find a version to use. So I understand the three, I think, major sections, dossier, the language dossier, and or the language passport and the dossier. But is there, for example, a, a certain version that's suitable for higher education for and for higher education yeah, or for university teaching that I can personally, for example, as a teacher, tailor for my students? Well, there should be because the circular version uh, which I briefly just mentioned and described uh, it should should still be available to you from from from, from the secretariat, isn't it? Uh, I, the, the, there's, I think, a a Spanish version of it. Is it a Spanish version on, on the website? And another issue: the language, because I only know English and Arabic. So, but, <laughs> but um, the. You, 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 it should be possible for you to get hold of that. I mean, the, 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 as I explained, we originally devised it in two languages. We created it in English, and then we got francophone colleagues to create a parallel version in French. And we so on page one we had English, page two the same thing in French, and so on all the way through. And the reason for that, as I said, is that French and English are the, the official languages of the Council of Europe. And in those days, you had to have one or other of those languages present in your, in your portfolio. So the idea then was that circular members, the national associations, or universities in those uh, associations could replace either the English or the French text by text in their own language of education, um, but but it should it should be possible for you, um, Anne Sabina. Yes. Can you yes. help? Yeah, we will check that. We will check that, and we can also, when um, relating back to this <clears throat> webinar, uh, inform also in the newsletter where these portfolios and specifically the scope of portfolio can be found. Yeah. Thank you. And another related question is, uh, again, we, you were talking about the validation of this ELP. My question was, if I will use it locally for my own purposes, is it okay if I use, if I develop to my own needs and not necessarily have it validated? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that, that's always been the case. Um, I mean, anyone at any time in the history of the ELP could develop a version that suited their needs. But if they wanted the Council of Europe to validate it mm -hmm. and then to correspond to the criteria set out in the principles and guidelines. Mm -hmm. I, you see, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief and try not to be boring. Um, for, for, from the beginning of all of this, I was involved in the validation process. I began, as I think I mentioned in the talk, um, by being a consultant to the committee. I then became a member of the committee. After that, I was vice chair of the committee, and for four years, I was chair. And during that latter time, I tried to steer things towards a situation where we could have key elements of the portfolio that people could simply download and use and create spaces where they could develop their own dimensions to suit their particular context. And to some degree, we achieved that in the website that you'll find if you go to the first of those URLs. It's www.coe.int slash portfolio. 
And if you click on the left hand button, which is, I think, developing an ELP, um, you, you'll find all sorts of stuff um, giving you basically the components of the ELP. And there are there are templates for different parts. And you can download those and make whatever use you want to of them. Thank you. Yes. Any other remarks or questions? Marta, Toto, Anne. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lito. And uh, hi, Salwa. We are both from the same <laughs> university. Um, I'm quite excited to see you because I think I'm sure that I have, I even quoted your book, books of yours in my um, dissertation in the past and I, I see you in the even through Zoom directly seeing so. And thank you very much for your uh, interesting uh, talk. I'm, I'm very interested in incorporating this uh, portfolio self-assessment in my teaching but my uh, because I, I think I very much agree with the idea of democratization of learning and students should um, own their learning uh, should take responsibility of their own learning and it's our responsibility to um, um, support them to be autonomous learners uh, to, to, to be life lifelong learner uh, and also reflection on any experience is very important I, I think so in that sense I think this portfolio is very good idea but my concern is um, some of my students may not engage in this activity unless we um in we officially include this portfolio in the um university assessment system which would lead to the their final grade mm -hmm. um then in that case maybe we have to give um mark for the portfolio or in that that, that is another program if the system doesn't allow me to include this portfolio in the assessment system, uh, assessment, official assessment, um, how would you advise, I should advise students to do this? So, sorry, do I make my yes, self understood? You absolutely clear yes I, I i think i would approach that question from two different angles first of all in trinity college dublin prior to my retirement we we had this system of institution-wide language learning we offered foreign language modules to all students in the university and they they um, could could take them or not as they as they pleased. We would have about two hundred students from the university, so the numbers were not huge but um, worthwhile. We based those modules on use of the circle version of the ELP, and we built into the way in which the courses were developed to focus on different parts of the portfolio at different points in, in each term. And we resolved the assessment issue by following two principles. First of all, in the criteria by which students assess themselves, we wanted them to be applying sorry let me start that sentence again we tried to make sure that in self-assessment our students were applying to their own learning and performance the same criteria 
as we applied when we assessed their performance in the end of module tests. And we worked quite hard at various points through the modules to ensure that their understanding of those criteria was as good as we could make it. And in that way, we tried to reach a situation where their self-assessment would not deviate by very much from the assessment of their examiners. But we also published the results of the end of module assessment in two columns, examiner's assessment, student's assessment. And, well, I mean, I don't know how what the university thought of that because I didn't ask them. We did it. But um, but 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 that's one possible solution. And the other thing uh, I, I would say is that I think if I were starting, if I if I were in charge of a university language center now and I wanted to do something along the lines of the ELP, I wouldn't actually start with a portfolio. I would start with the proficiency levels relevant to the courses, and I would go on to elaborate on the descriptors, you know, the descriptors for listening and speaking and reading and writing, I would elaborate on those descriptors in relation to the content that learners were expected to cover in their courses. And I would make th that work a basic foundation for specifying the goals of courses, modules, whatever, but I'd also use these descriptors in order to guide planning of courses, to involve students in self and peer assessment, and so on and so forth. In other words, I'd, I'd, I'd use those tools to begin to bring all the work into alignment with the CFR the proficiency levels, but also the understanding of language use that underpins the CFR. And I would allow portfolio learning to grow out of that. Because I think that's not that that's non-threatening to the institution. Sabina. Yes, if I might just support uh, David with this idea, I can say that in, in our language centers, in all the course descriptions, in all the definition of learning outcomes, they're all aligned to the CFR levels. Mm. And uh, so students will know from the very beginning uh, in which we are, in which, you know, in which sector of the CFR they are going to learn. Mm. And uh, teachers can rely and can refer to the Sorry, refer to the CFR to the, the learning outcomes as uh, based on the CFR, the descriptors linked to them for peer assessment and self assessment. So students can have midterm assessments. They can they also learn to to reflect on their uh, learning outcomes. And they you can have also you don't need to have the whole portfolio. You can have like a logbook where students reflect uh, why they they made a, a, a certain success and what helped them to learn and how they learn and then you can also uh, have uh, have them discuss the results in groups and mm. um, i would just like to ask something about the language portfolio so on the other hand while the cfr integration of the cfr or the alignment of our courses uh, with the cfr has has been uh, like a default uh, culture uh, for many years use of the portfolio is a different story and it's again it seems to be too 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 big a tool or too complex a tool but i uh, would just like to refer to that and also um at the same time referring to your suggestions as for um circles being like a promoter or a new promoter of the of the portfolio 
uh, when I when I see now there are many inter-institutional cooperation project, uh, projects, language learning projects, where one could easily easily uh, integrate the a portfolio for um, both plur, uh, individual plurilingualism and also multilingual um, multilingual uh, communication and develop descriptors which would really reflect to this learning experience, which is very much learner-centered, this is very much needs-based. And uh, for example, I know of some, some of these projects, we are also going to have them, uh, some of them presented in one of our talks. And this is something we could kind of uh, start a discussion about within our community. And for example, another example is one um, of uh, international uh, alliances. So there, there will be, or there has been, um, a set of new programs for, for example, uh, the Bachelor of European Studies in the UNA Europa. So where I'm also going to suggest, um, I have handed in a multi, uh, mo the idea of a module of multilingual uh, communication where students work together in a multilingual project, an uh, interdisciplinary project. So they produce a real product. And uh, I mean, a, a scientific product, a blog or a paper or a video. Yeah. But then they reflect at the same time. And the, the communication about this outcome, the product, will be in different languages. And they reflect on how they communicate. They get some tutor assistance of language. It is specifically trained for this. Uh, plurilingual tutoring and they get of course uh, they write log books and so on so um when when this project proposal should it be accepted i would also uh, like us to develop such a mini portfolio just which will serve and help the students and uh, kind of reflect this specific experience and perhaps then have the made uh, well have have them make the experience that such a portfolio or such a language learning reflection could be helpful also for the future. So this is perhaps something which can lead to more sustainable awareness of one's own language learning biography. So yeah. I've been talking a long time, but just to I'd uh, like to, to align these two, <laughs> to come yeah. back these two uh, reflections, yeah. I, I, it's a very sensible line of development from my uh, from my perspective. Can, can I come back though to the problem of reluctance to use the portfolio and so on. Um, I, when, when the portfolio was first introduced to Europe, I think the second one that was uh, came out of the pilot projects and was uh, validated was, was the one developed in, in France. Um, so it was for lycée uh, students. In, in, in France. And the then Minister for Education, Jack Long, was very deeply committed to the portfolio, and he printed enough copies of the portfolio to distribute them free of charge to every lycéen in France at that time. But that was all he did. And these portfolios landed on students' desks, and they hadn't a clue what they were about. And the teachers didn't have much better clue. And a large number of these portfolios just ended up uh, as, as waste paper. Now, in Integrate Island Language and Training, the refugee school for which I was responsible for, we encouraged a learner autonomy, learner empowerment approach to teaching. In other words, we expected our teachers to discuss learning aims and outcomes with their learners. We expected them to negotiate the content of each term's work uh, by conducting an ongoing needs analysis with their, with their learners, and, and so on and so forth. And to support this, they had the elements, the components of the milestone ELP. So instead of giving each learner a complete portfolio mm. they used various parts of the portfolio as worksheets planning documents and so on to underpin the teaching in the course of the term and by the end of the term the students would have compiled 
the beginnings of an ELP. And they suddenly themselves began to see how these things came together. And it wasn't a matter of the students saying, oh, look, I can't do that. That's a whole lot of extra work. Because their work was, in fact, all based on, guided by making use of elements of the portfolio. And um, and 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 that that worked very well. And we used the same kind of approach in our institution-wide language program in, in Trinity College. But to make that work, of course, you've got to have a certain kind of pedagogical philosophy, which is radically learner-centered and believes the fundamental principles on which the Council of Europe's language education work has always been based. Thank you, David. Farva? Yeah, uh, I would like to also add that uh, in my case, teaching Arabic uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University. I started, like you said, Professor Tauri, started from uh, designing a curriculum based on can-do statements. And I have to say that it was, it was very helpful. Like you said, it was working as a constructive alignment. So my can-do statements are the learning outcomes is what the students will be assessed on. They know they need to, to be that. However, uh, obviously I am I am within the system, so I have to follow the same assessment style within uh, the, the institute, which are not bad. We have some freedom. We have a, like a portfolio where we have four assessments. Uh, I can make them integrated uh, assessment or I can assess uh, individual skills in each of them. Um, uh, however, still, as I said, I haven't experimented with the portfolio and I was thinking of it, I don't know if, um, if you would agree with me with that, as a reflective tool, because as I said, I don't, I'm not sure, I haven't studied yet well how it can be integrated and like Sheiko said before that um, we don't know how the students will receive it and the, the quality assurance issues. Uh, so I was thinking of having it as an extra uh, extra element. So when the students do a piece of speaking or something, maybe write what they learned from it or something like that. And another point I want to add, talking about ongoing analysis of learners' needs in 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 in, uh, in programs like uni-wide, university-wide programs, we have new cohorts every year, yeah. not necessarily the same cohort. And this poses an issue with with following up with a certain cohort, knowing what their needs are, following up with it. And recently I'm studying for a master in higher education and I want to implement an action-based approach. And again, the first thing I was told is that I can't, I can't after the, the, the course descriptions were out for the students, I can't make that many changes. So we're always limited with some kind of policies or regulations that also limit how we can use these innovative uh, tools. Yeah, I, what, what you've just said prompts me to say two things. First of all, you talk about the portfolio as an extra. And, 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 and the problem about extras is that they're always the first things to be axed, the mm -hmm. first things to go. Um, I, I, I would strongly recommend that starting from where you are which you've described in terms of aligning your um, courses with with the cfr and so on um and you develop a, a portfolio on the basis of that in by by having um i mean have, having having worksheets having self and peer assessment uh, routines um, and and configure them in such a way that your students keep those in a, a folder, a ring binder or whatever, and gradually compile a portfolio. You don't even need to call it a portfolio. You can call it, I don't know, course record or anything you like. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is about the ongoing needs analysis business and the fact that you have to um, you, you know, you have to say what the course content is and, and what the learning outcomes are. Um, 
uh, of course, we all face that issue. I mean, we all have to do the same thing. But nevertheless, we can make all kinds of adjustments in the way we deliver the course mm -hmm. in order to make sure that we mediate the course content to our students and deliver it in ways that most appropriately correspond to what they bring with them to the learning context. If I, if I may, uh, oh, sorry, Salwa, please go. No, no, fine. I was just saying thank you. You go. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say that even in a, in a language center where there is um, a philosophy that is uh, mainly learner-centered, it's always difficult because um, <clears throat> in, in the educational system as a whole, in France, uh, and, and I guess it's the same in other countries, uh, you need to give marks to students. Well, in France, we do because um, uh, learning a language is compulsory for university students. And so the, the, the language they learn uh, is a compulsory part of their studies. And therefore, we absolutely need to give them a mark at the end. But the idea can be to um, try and include in those marks elements that are not really a portfolio, but that are more or less part of it. Uh, this is what we try to do at the University of Lorraine, where I teach. We have what we call a logbook. Um, it's actually... Um, uh, an electronic logbook, uh, because the uh, one of the problems of the portfolio also is that it's still on paper, and up to to my knowledge, no electronic version has been uh, uh, developed. I think there was um, some trial in the in the two thousand and ten. I think I, I I can't remember the name of the of the. Uh, that electronic version of the portfolio, but I think it has disappeared, unfortunately. And so a logbook can contain elements such as language biography, uh, elements of work that have been done by the students that can be included in that. And more or less it um, has elements that can be uh, also given marks, even though the, the, the ideal, is yeah. not to give marks to that. For the system, we need to do it. However, even if we all know that if we want to promote learner autonomy, uh, we need to encourage self-assessment. Um, I don't know how it is in other countries, but I've discovered that in France, most students are afraid of self-assessment. And when you give them the choice of different tools which they can use in order to self-assess some of their skills, which is exactly what I did yesterday with, with my students who are studying for a master's degree in psychology, I, I offer them to test their skills using the CEFR grid that is to say, reading the descriptors and deciding which is their level in each of their skills or using Dialong, which still works, which, which was developed in the, I think almost 20 years ago, which relies on the CEFR, but which is not really a self-assessment tool, except that the students can use it and they obtain a result but it's like a test, or even I offer them to use um, a self-assessment reading test that was developed at the University of Ottawa for the students who wanted to, to study in psychology in English for the foreign student. And very often, I, I, I'm well, yesterday, uh, more than 70% of the students chose to test themselves with Dialong instead of trusting themselves and trying 
to do tests which were more um, on which they had to rely on their own um, yes. skills to assess themselves. See what I mean? So I guess it's because in the French educational system, they haven't been used to doing that. And that's one of the problems. Yes. Um, uh, on, uh, I mean, I, the, the answer to that that I, I would always give, I suppose, is that um, in the learner autonomy approach that I would always have used and would recommend others to use, the idea of involving learners in goal setting and self-assessment is, is a fundamental element of the whole teaching learning process. Um, and, 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 and so they're involved in self-assessment without realizing it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's easy for me to sit here and say that kind of thing, of course. Um, can, can I just say a little about the analog versus digital thing? Mm -hmm. Because during the history of ELP validation, that the, there were a handful of digital ELPs uh, submitted. The first one was developed by Equals, the European Association for Quality Language Services, working together with Alte. Mm -hmm. and what this was in the days when I mean, around the you know very early two thousands, when the idea of having web based learning management systems was still a twinkle in developers' eyes, and. What they developed was a a portfolio that you could get from them on a floppy disk and use in a single version in your own computer to to track your your own learning. And in in use, that obviously had one big disadvantage compared with pencil and paper. If you've got a class of learners, who've all got a paper portfolio, then there are various ways in which they can share and exchange and so on in class and out of it. But if you've got a, a digital portfolio that's a closed system on a single machine, that, that that kind of thing is not so good. But obviously, things developed quite rapidly from then on. And in about, you said 2010, it was probably about that time the Dutch invested an enormous sum of money in creating a language learning platform for schools. And the, the, it was, you know, it was a huge resource for self-instruction of various kinds. But you, when once you were a member of this thing, you had access to a private space where you had a version of the ELP in digital form. And if I remember correctly, you could give permission to selected people to share your portfolio or to view your portfolio. And that was how, for example, members of a particular class could give their teacher permission to see what they were doing on their portfolios. It was a it, it was very well developed. It was quite challenging to use. I mean intellectually challenging. And it disappeared very quickly because no one used it. Um, but in the uni which Italian university, um, Padua, uh, Fiona Diel uh, and her colleagues in Padua um, created a sort of hybrid version of the ELP using the circular model. So bits of it they transferred to their learning management system because that was how by the sort of 20 teens, uh, their students were working and they were communicating with their students and so on. But they also had some parts that they retained uh, as paper uh, because they used them uh, in, 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 in classes, in workshops and seminars and so on. They, they published a bit about that in some of the early issues of the um, LL, Language Learning Higher Education Journal. Mm -hmm. I've just found the name of the portfolio I was referring to. It was called Lollipop. And yeah. I've, I've just found um, a PowerPoint 
online somewhere and I discovered that uh, it, it's in fact somebody I know, Christian Olivier, who was part of that project with uh, somebody who was in in Dublin City University, Juliette Peshna. Do right. you know her? And apparently it was funded by a Lingua project and there were 12 university in institutions from eight different countries. But I don't know if they actually managed to create the project. I think it existed for a while, but it, it seems to have disappeared, unfortunately. And it was an electronic portfolio. Yes, yes. I'd, I'd forgotten that example, but now you mention it. I And I I, I know the uh, the people at Dublin City University who were involved in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, the 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 difficulty with having, uh, you know, for example, a, a, a circle portfolio that would be used by all universities who are affiliated to circle is that it becomes too rigid. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow enough variation um, mm -hmm. for, for, from, you know, to take account of specificity, specificities of institutional context and so on. So, yeah. that, I, I mean, as I said a, a little while ago, if 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 I were involved in this, I would, I would start with the CFR and the checklists, and the course objectives, and and all of that. I mean, much as uh, Sabina has uh, herself uh, described, mm -hmm. and but but then I think in parallel, it's important to develop. Um, learner autonomy approaches to teaching and learning um, and, and of course learner autonomy approaches require documentation of learning because you can't control or manage your learning unless you're keeping careful track of where it is you've been and where you're hoping to get to and where you do get and that means having some kind of Logbook. I think you mentioned having your students having logbooks, Sabina, and um, you, you need something like that. Again, the extent to which that should be structured is, to me, an open question. Um, yes. So, um, yeah. Well, if I just may perhaps um, wrap up a little bit the discussion and bring us bring the the webinar to an end. I would like to in, also encourage the all of us in our language learning community to take into consideration la the latest developments and challenges universities are facing, uh, mainly also linked to AI, to artificial intelligence, and the whole question of the author, the whole questions of personal responsibility and of tracking tracking back one's own learning. And I think this could also be a chance for our uh, language learning institutions to to align uh, our efforts um, about self reflection, autonomous learning, uh, responsibility for one's own learning to developments uh, going on at our university. So we can even contribute to some uh, ideas which are now uh, broadly discussed about how to how to foster this uh, authorship and, and this concept of agency and this concept of responsibility. So maybe we can make a contribution or we can contribute to a discussion which, uh, because we have been uh, working uh, within this or according to some principles of autonomous learning and, uh, and portfolio learning uh, before for some years. So perhaps this is also, uh, an encouraging moment to, because uh, as a counterpart to, to perhaps the, the chance we seem too heavy. So I think there are good chances for us to just to be grasped. And I would like to come back to your suggestion, uh, David, and bring it into our community uh, to, to uh, start with a project where we start from perhaps specific projects going on in inter-institutional le learning and then uh, and try to to build on that uh, um, elements of logbooks or yes based on this, the checklist or which are specifically also aligned to this these projects which then could be used within the community as case studies or could be presented and and perhaps later on relates to some research and article in our our journal. 
I would like to thank you very much again, David, for your time. And I would like to thank all the colleagues taking part and to, for your questions and contributions. And I will hope that many more uh, will um, take the advantage of watch the, the recording and, and engaging our further discussion. So thanks, thank you, thanks to everybody. And I wish you all um, good luck with uh, the CFR and the portfolio, Salva and Checo. And, uh, Good for further discussions and have a lovely evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. But let me been... thank you so much for your attention. But it's good to know that things are happening at Manchester Metropolitan University. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I will work together, I think. <laughs> thank okay. you, Professor Letton. It's really interesting. Thank you, Sabina. And I would like to apologize, Sabina, earlier when you were trying to to connect or some, I was in a car driving and I was joining from a no, mobile it's... phone. So, so I was on no the No problem, no problem. No Thank problem. you very much. Have a lovely Thank evening. You. Bye bye. Thank you bye very bye. much. Bye bye. Have a good bye. evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.